Uh, today we're starting a brand new series called Made for Mondays, Made for Mondays. Let me just ask as we started this morning, how many of you, when you think about Mondays, you, you really enjoy Monday mornings? Anybody? Oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. The most of the other of you are normal, right? But, but, but maybe the reason why is, is you need a new job. So if you're thinking about a new job or a new career, consider these that might give special meaning to your Mondays. This guy is a mosquito test. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's, how, how, many, how many weeks would you do that? Which, which is not as bad as this one, though. This guy, he's got a smile on his face, and it's kind of like, come at me. He is a vomit collector. That's what he does. He collects vomit in the UK underneath one of their crazy rides. Uh, I'm not sure how long he's going to do that job, but he's doing it right there. This job, you can actually make 40K a year being a dog food or dog food animal food tester. This, is a, this guy is actually a, a, well, he's like a celebrity. He's got such a, he says, a refined palate, <laughs> which whatever that means. And if, if none of those help, this one I think is going to be really, you get close to people. This is a, <laughs> you ever wonder, you ever wonder how they test whether deodorants work or not? These people sit in a hot, smelly room. And they smell up to 60 armpits an hour. <laughs> 60 armpits an hour, baby. You're moving at that clip. So, the, look, if, if maybe, maybe you're bored with your job, try something new. <laughs> try something new. It might help. Uh, but, but today I'm talking to moms. I'm talking to dads who you stay at home with your kids. That is your work on Monday morning. You go to work. It means changing diapers. It means preparing food. It means keeping the kids from sticking their fingers in the light sockets and training and investing in them. For others of you, it means working for the city or maybe you're a lawyer or a doctor or you're a landscaper or you're whatever it might be. Uh, for some of you, it means being a student. That's what you can do on Sunday morning. Your job is to be a student. Whatever it is, I had a guy in my, in my small group. We, I meet with some business guys and some dads and husbands. Uh, every Wednesday evening, and uh, one of the guys asked this really, I think it's a great question. I want to pick up on this question. I want to answer this question today. He asked me, he said, Greg, I, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding how the spiritual connects with my real life because the reality is that I only spend about an hour and a half in church on Sunday during the week, and I spend the rest of my life not in church. And, you know, he said, I can understand how your work has significance or meaning or purpose or whatever because it, it seems like a spiritual work. It's a calling, right? But my work, I mean, the people that I work with, they're not trying to know God. They're not trying to serve Him. They're not trying to worship Him. There's no Christian music playing. There's no God, Bible, church in the name of the company that I work for. Most of the people, they, they actually do say Jesus, but it's only when they're mad or frustrated or things aren't working. So... That's where I live. That's where I hang out. That's true, right? It's such a great question because about 30% of our lives will be spent at work. That's, that's not hard and fast. It's just a general, about 30%. And about globally, 13% of people say that in their work, they're, they're enjoying it and they're engaging, which means they're, they're, they're in it. They're, they're involved. They're finding purpose and fulfillment and meaning in their work. Only 13%. Maybe some of you are going, I'm, I'm one of the other 85, 87% that is struggling to find any kind of purpose. Today, I want to I talk about us because most of our life will be spent outside of this hour and 15 minutes that we spend here together or in the small group that you're a part of or in the other, you know, Christian activity. In fact, there, there is, uh, there's a guy named Plato who, you know, before Christ came, he really expounded on this. But what happened through the centuries is that the idea of the spiritual and the idea of the secular, secular meaning not necessarily the environment where God is at work or apparently at work, those two things got separated from one another. And in our world today, many of us have espoused this idea of the separation of what we consider the spiritual realm where God is, and that's the eternal realm, and that's the really important part. And then there's this secular realm. That's where we live, we work. It's the material, physical realm. It's kind of the lower realm. And those two things are kind of separate things. 
So, Greg, of course, when we're inside the church, we're doing a spiritual work, right? I mean, we're praying. We're going to read the Bible together. We're, we're worshiping and singing songs. We feel the presence of God and the power of God. So it's obvious spiritual. But then I go to work on Monday morning. Or I go to school on Monday morning. Or I'm changing diapers and washing clothes and cleaning dishes. How, how is that spiritual and we have this tendency to separate the two but that is a false tendency that is not the way that God created it to be in fact God created all of life to be this sacred because God is involved realm and so this guy named Paul is encouraging people and this is going to be our our our, our staple scripture for the for the series he's encouraging them not to separate what they consider spiritual the God part of them, from the secular, which is the world that they live in. Can't separate those two. In the early Christian church, and I'm not going to talk about this, but it became, it was this constant struggle. It was called Gnosticism. There was this separation. So invest in, you know, there are many different ways that that thing could go. But don't, you can't separate the two. And this is what Paul says to the Romans. And he tells them this. And this is the message version. I like this because I feel like it just it gives a little bit fuller understanding. It says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. In other words, we need God's help to do this. Take your ordinary, your everyday life, and then he breaks it down. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life. Take all of that and place it before God as an offering. This is truly the way that you worship Him. Now, I know what you're thinking. Most of you are thinking what we did was, that was worship. And right now, if I can listen to this guy speak for the next 30 minutes, that's worship. And when we give in the offering, that's worship. But Paul says, no, 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 don't miss this. Take your ordinary, everyday life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're walking around, your work, and present it to God as an offering to Him. Your Monday is meant to be a time of worship. Your Monday is meant to be a sacred moment. Your Monday, your Tuesday, your Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that is all meant to be your sacred time of service to God. That is our opportunity to worship God. When we say, God, this is your day, and in this day I'm going to love you, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to worship you in it, I'm going to put you right in the middle of this day, it becomes this beautiful offering to God that we were created to give to Him. This is truly our worship to God. It's not just this. Now, most of us think that the spiritual and the worship happens here, and then outside, it's just all secular. And I want to encourage you, that's not it. Now, we, we totally get this because football season is starting, right? <laughs> football season is starting. And, and today, there are a bunch of games that are being played. Most of the players are not preparing because a part of the game is also this locker room time, right? This is where the coach gets them together and he gets them on the same game plan and he inspires them so they can go out from the locker room and play in the game that's on the field, right? Most of us think that Sunday is the game. It's not. Sunday's the locker room. Monday is the game. Tuesday is the game. Are you getting this? I don't know if you're confused or if you're just like, I'm not buying this. No, no, Monday is the game. When you step into your home and you say, you know what, I'm going to be the mom that God created me to be. I'm going to take care of these babies. I'm going to train them up. I'm going to equip them to do more than they can imagine they'll ever do for God. That's the game. Monday is when you, when you walk into your office place and you're the boss, the way that you treat your employees, the way that you as an employee work, that's the game. This is the locker room. We're, you're getting the game plan. We're going through the scriptures together. I'm inspiring you so that you can go and do the work of ministry and worship on Monday. Right? Most of us, we leave God here and we go into the work and you're going into the game and God is in the locker room. That's not, th this is not the game. The game happens on Monday. And so this is what Paul's trying to say. Look, the game is your ordinary everyday life take that and offer that as a worship as an offering before God in the why you do it and in the way you do it in the why you do it and in the way you do it you can put them on the screen so today I want to talk about the why we work and the way we work because this is our offering it's not this this here 
This is part of it, but this is preparation. This is the locker room. This is where we get ready. This is where you get ready to see your work and to see the people in your work through the lens of the good news, which is called the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is your responsibility, all of us. It is to live our life in faith and to see the world and to see what we do through the lens of the gospel. It changes the way that you do it. And that's what I want to talk about today. And so I want to start with the why we work, the why we work. So to understand the why we work, let's go back to the very beginning, to the one who designed it, who created work. And this is what he said in Genesis 1.26. I love this. And so as, as, as you're turning in your Bible to Genesis 1.26, uh, remember this, that in order for you to understand, you know, work, you, you really got to gotta go to God and, and get it from His Word. And let his word shape the, your view, your perspective of work. And so here's what God says in the book of Genesis in verse 26. He says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. After he had created everything, he says this, Then let us make man kind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over all the livestock and all the wild animals. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but God creates man in his image so that there is a purpose for this so that he can rule over all of creation. In other words, God created man, and he also gave him a job. It's the first thing he did. He created you, I'll give you life, and now I'm going to give you a job. And he says, over all the creatures that move on the ground, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So God created mankind. He gave them a job, and it's very specific. I created you in my image. You and I were created in the image of God. He created us. We created, your, your life is not, no matter what, you, what you've seen on YouTube or whatever, here's the reality. You and I didn't become these amazing, beautifully created, magnificent, wonderful, self-aware, future-planning, free-thinking, intelligent beings by just sliming out of some mud or primordial ooze and then over millions of years evolving to become you. That's not how it happened. Here's how it happened. God made you for His purpose. You were made by God. You were made for God. You are beautifully, individually, intricately designed by a master designer. You were created by God. And you were created by a God who creates. He is a creator. From the very beginning, the first verse in the whole Bible says, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's see. Genesis 1.1, God created the heavens and the earth. All right, well, anyway, God, he, he did. Created the heavens and the earth. That's in Genesis 1.1. That's what it says. Then God created the sky. Then God created the animals. And he created the plants. And he created life. And he, cre he was just creating, creating, creating. So you were created in the image of one who creates. And you were created in the image of one who creates so that you could as well create. So this is how it goes in Genesis as we continue reading on. Thus the heavens and the earth they were completed in all their vast array, and by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So by the seventh day, God himself, he was already done with all of his work, but it still needed to be developed. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. Now, now, now think about this. When we think about rest, there's a couple different elements of this. There is physical rest, and we're actually going to talk about this in two weeks Work and rest. Those are two important things. But in this particular scripture, what really God is saying is God takes this moment. Think about this. When we think about work, God takes this moment to look at everything he's created and to enjoy it. And he kind of just looks at it, and as he's taking in everything that his hands had made and he had made with his words, he steps back and he goes, oh, that's it's good. Work, work is, my work is good. And not just good, but he said, this is, very, this is muy, muy ono. I'm pretty sure that's how it was translated in the original Greek. This is muy ono. It's kind of a Spanish local thing. This is very good. And he says, work is good. You were created to work. This is why if you ever get sick for periods of time, long periods of time, there's just something, you, you, you begin to feel a little down about yourself and a little down about life because you and I really were created to work. 
by a God who doesn't do work as a default. I guess I couldn't do anything else, so I'm going to work. i got to work. No, no, God loves working. In fact, he loves the product of his own hands, and he steps back and he looks and he says, this is really good. So what do you think that kind of God in whose image we were created in is going to ask and give for you and I? He's going to give us work, right? This is good. This is a good thing, and I want you to enjoy this thing, and you were created for it. So here's what he does in verse 15. The Lord God took the man, he put him in the garden to work it. I know some of you are like, man, I, I wish you'd have said to throw up a hammock and to sleep underneath that coconut tree forever. He didn't. He said, I put you in the garden in my image to be like me, and I want you to carry on what I started. Work, because it's good. I want you to produce. I want you to create because I'm a creator. You were created in my image. So you were made to work and to produce and to create. And so he says, take care of it. Nurture it. Develop what I've started. And so in your notes this morning, the why we work is because our work is from God. You were created in the image of a creator to create. Our work is from God. Now, I, I don't want some of you going, you know what? I've been selling drugs for a long time, and I'm, I'm just, I, I've been trying to find some type of justification. Okay, obviously, not every work is from God, right? So works that honor God, that move in the direction of glorifying and, and representing his kingdom, those are works that are from God, right? And they're just, you, you, you can figure out which ones are not. But we were created to work because our creator is a worker. He produces, he creates. It's not an act of punishment. It's not. It's not a consequence of our sin because at this point there actually is no sin, right? So this is not because you did this, Adam. Now, he, he did say because you did this, your work is going to be harder than it should have been. And that is the consequence is your work is going to be harder. And this is not just about you. This is not just about our personal fulfillment. This is not just about our self-enlightenment and our self-actualization so we choose work for ourselves. No, this is actually working for the benefit of creation for others, for all, to serve people. That's really what God's work was for you and I. But our work is from God. It comes from Him. Not only is our work from God, but it is supposed to be for God. It is supposed to be for God. Our work is for God. Here's what it says in Colossians 3.23. And this may be a good scripture from all the ones that we're reading today to, to really memorize and to think about. It says, whatever you do, whatever you do, your mom in the home, listen up. Your dad in the home, listen up. You're the owner of a company, listen up. You're an employee, listen. You're a student, listen. Whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart. And here's why. Because you work or as working for the Lord, not for human masters. So Paul is saying, whatever you do, don't work as if you're just working to serve your boss or get a good grade or a paycheck. That's not your boss. That's not your job. That's not your ultimate, you know, good job, attaboys, they come from me, God. I'm the one who sees it all. You work for me. So if you work for the Honolulu Police Department, you don't work for HPD. You actually work for God. So do your job in a way that honors your boss. Not your supervisor who signs the check. Your real supervisor who gave you life. If you're a mom, you know, when you're changing dirty diapers and you're making those meals and you're cleaning up and you're running after and you're training and you're equipping, and I know how it is. We have five. You get to the end of the day and you just go, what was that all about? Here's what it's all about. You work for God. And you are shaping the next generation. You are, if you're a teacher in here, you are not just like, I got tenure, so I'm going to ride this thing out and get a paycheck. No, 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 no. You are fulfilling a sacred calling, a ministry. You are giving divine impartation to the future of this world. Not just because of them or because of a paycheck, but because of the one that you really serve, which is God. So whatever you do, you go, well, you know what? I don't work for anybody. I'm self-employed. I work for myself. And I kind of fudge on my taxes just a little bit. And maybe I shave corners and I, I don't do things as well. But you know what? Nobody really sees that. No, no, somebody sees that. Your boss sees that. What do you, I, 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 I'm okay with it. Yeah, but your boss may not be okay with it. Whatever you do, you don't work for you. You work for God. 
So do it in a way that honors him. Do it in a way that serves him. When your boss comes to you and you're leading a project or you get an assignment, receive that assignment, not as like, oh, my boss, give me another assignment. No, no, this is the assignment that comes from God. This is my ministry. This is my sacred opportunity. This is my opportunity to worship God. So we do what we do, not as serving other people, but as serving the one who gave us the work. It's our God. Doesn't that help? Doesn't it just help change the way that we engage with our vocation, with our career, with our studies? You're not studying to get a grade. You're not studying to impress a professor. You're not studying because mom and dad threatened you that if you don't get at least C's this quarter, you're out of school. You're not, st- you know, you may be studying for that, but <laughs> what you're really studying for is you're studying for the pleasure of God. You're studying for your boss. You're studying for your ultimate professor. You're studying and wanting to be an example because what you do, whatever it is, you do not for humans, not for others, but you do it for the pleasure of God. Because your work, your daily work, is meant to be worship. And it becomes this sacred vocation, this sacred calling when we see it as a ministry assignment given by the one who has equipped us for it and the one who has called us to it. Even if it's not on this pulpit or in the church, especially if it's out there. That's the game day. It's out there. So we work. Our work is from God. Our work is for God. And then our work ultimately Our work is with God, but before we get there, I want to say this. The way we work is so important. So we talked about the why we work, but now let me talk a little bit about the way we work. And Paul talks about the way that we work. And he says this to, to Titus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this down so if some of it like, strikes you the wrong way as we read this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it a little bit. Teach slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything. Okay, let me just explain this real quick. Paul is not, and slavery has never been, is something that has been justifiable or in our culture is right or condoned. Paul is basically speaking to a reality of their culture. And to reality of their culture, there were many reasons why people got in positions where they were actually slaves of other people. They were, they were property and owed other people debt, and one of the ways to, do, to work it off was to become a slave of somebody else. Paul is not endorsing that. He's basically addressing, though, the reality of their current world, and he's speaking to Christians who find themselves as slaves. So this is really important for us because no matter what you do, Paul is going to give us a way that we can give dignity to our work no matter what your work is. And so he says, even if you find yourself, especially if you find yourself as a slave, You do not receive dignity from your job. You receive dignity or you give dignity to what you do by the way that you do it. And so here's what he says. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything. To try and please them, not talk back to them, and not steal from them. This is so helpful, right? Paul is basically saying, man, don't be a disruption in your workplace. Don't be an irritation to your boss. Don't be talking a bunch of smack to all the different coworkers and disrupting things. Don't steal from your company. Don't steal time from your company by hanging out on Instagram and Facebook when you're supposed to be working. Don't do any of that, but instead, this is what he says, but show that you can be fully trusted so that in every single way they may make the teaching about God our Savior. Everybody say this with me. One more time. Attractive. Okay, so watch what he's saying. He's saying if you work this way as a slave, you will actually make the good news about Jesus attractive. You will make it desirable. You will make it something that, and you will make Jesus known for all the right reasons instead of, unfortunately, for many of the wrong reasons. I'm just going to tell you this, business guys, I hear this from you guys all the time. Some of the most difficult people that you work with are those who are Christians. I don't know why. Just seem to do their work a little bit sloppier, assume a little bit more. It should not be that way. And he's basically saying, teach slaves not to do that. So do, the, and this is not you standing up in your cubicle, you know, all right, I'm going to preach Jesus. No, no, no. This is you going to work and working your tail off. This is you getting there early, staying late, and working hard. 
This is not you playing on Instagram or Facebook or, you know, chatting. and t- I know you can do that, but this is you honoring your company and the time that they pay you to be there. Not to be on Instagram, not to be playing Fortnite or Candy Crush, right? <laughs> I know this is really convicting right now. This is. Because this happens. I can't tell you how many people waste time. But God is... Paul, through Paul saying, look, you, as people who know your work is from God and are doing it for him, you should work at it with all your heart as if you're serving the Lord. And so don't take those, op- do it, do this with everything that you got. Get there early, stay there late, sacrifice, be a part, add your creativity, your leadership. And when you do this, this is the amazing thing. God says, through Paul, it becomes this spiritual ministry you make the good news of Jesus attractive as you express your faith and the grace that you've received in the way that you work, in the way that you lead, in the way that you treat other co-workers. If you're a boss, in your generosity. If you're a co-worker, in your generosity. In your leadership, in your creativity. As we walk into our Monday mornings like this, Paul actually says that we make the good news of Jesus Christ attractive. But Greg, I'm just changing a diaper. No, you're not. You have the opportunity to worship the Lord. I know, you're going like, what? Really? Dirty bottom staring me in the face? Yes. As you take that work, you put God right in the middle of it, and you say, God, this is not just... A, a work. This is a work. This is my opportunity to serve you and to do this with everything I have as if I'm serving you. This is a sacred calling, a ministry assignment. So you and I, we should strive to be the best employees at our company. And when we do, God says that we actually make the good news of God attractive. And by the way, I feel like we also change a culture where, you know, I mean, I, I talk, again, I talk to many of you business guys, and you tell me it is so hard to find good work because people just don't care. All they want is a paycheck. It was not meant to be that way. It was meant to be this sovereign calling from God. Your vocation, what you do. So it's really important to, to feel like this thing is from God, and I'm doing it for Him. And the way that you work is so important. In fact, I do believe that if you work with excellence, it will increase your influence in your workplace. Not only when you make the gospel attractive, but you will become valuable to a company. Wherever God has placed you, work at it with all your heart. As your assignment, your ministry assignment from God, and as you do that, and you do your best right there, God will use that because, lastly, we are God's co-workers in His service. So not only is our work from God, not only is our work for God, but we work with God. That particular scripture is actually talking about Paul's perspective on his work as, a, as an apostle, as a missionary. But it's not limited to that. Everything that we do, we are basically, when you see it like this, God is calling us into his purpose and his agenda in the earth. God has a purpose and he's got an agenda in your workplace. And the way that people are going to see that and be involved in it is when you embrace your work, understanding that God is calling, this is God calling me to be his co-worker. This is God wanting to be involved in my workplace, and he's chosen you. Wherever God has planted you, it is not by accident. You are there because God wants to be there. God needs to be there. So he's planted you there. You are God in that place. You understand what I'm saying, right? I don't want some of you walking into work going, ah, I'm God in this place. No, no. You are, you are the way that God reaches into your work environment because isn't it true that, that you work with people who do not know Jesus? We all do. You go, well, I work for a Christian company. Then you work with a lot of people that don't know Jesus. That's probably the truth, right? We all do. And you were going, well, and they're not going to come to church. I mean, most of them are actually not seeking for God in church. That's why God has planted you there. Because even though they may not come seeking Him, He is seeking them. And He's seeking them through your life. And you're planting wherever God's planting you. It's not random. It is by God's design. You are entering into God's 
calling, His partnership, and it is sacred, and it is holy. In fact, there are people right now that are praying for their husband or their wife in their workplace, right? There's a, there's a praying husband who's praying for his wife. God, I just pray that you would somehow meet her, that you would reach her, Lord, and, and, and feels completely out of his control to be able to do anything, or a spouse praying for her husband. But God has given an answer already, and you're the answer. You are going to be an answer to somebody's prayer. You go, well, I, I can't do that. I mean, that's what a pastor does. I'll tell you what a pastor does. Let me just, like, I'll tell you what a pastor does. A pastor points people to Jesus and to truth. You can do that. You can point people to Jesus and to his truth. That's what a, what a pastor does. You can be the pastor in your work environment. You can point people to Jesus, and you can point people to truth, and you can be an answer to somebody's deep prayer. A couple months ago, moms and dads dropped their students off at the University of Hawaii from all over the country, from all over the world even. They came, and there are praying parents who are going, God, will you please meet my son or my daughter? And they're so concerned right now for what's going to happen to them at the University of Hawaii. And every, every week, there are moms and dads dropping their kids off at Kamuki Middle School, New Valley Middle School, Kalani High School, Roosevelt High School, Kaiser High School. And they're praying for their kids. God, help them to meet the right people. Lord, I know that you've called them to do something great. Please help them and meet them. And you know what? You're going to be an answer to that prayer. You are going to be an answer to that prayer that they've been crying out to God. And God is going to step onto their campus through you. You're not just a teacher. You are somebody with a sacred calling to influence people in the direction to point them to Jesus Christ. And the way that you do that is not just by standing up and pounding your Bible and saying, you know everybody's so bad. You do this by doing whatever you do as unto the Lord. And as we do that and we go the extra mile, we serve and we don't fight against people, but we actually love them and treat them with the grace and kindness of God in our workplace. We make the good news of Jesus Christ attractive and we co-work with God doing this amazing spiritual work. That's how important you are and how important what you do on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday are. Not just this hour and a half here. This guy named John Coltrane is arguably one of the, one of the, you know, one of the best jazz saxophonist that ever lived. Um, how many of you know John Coltrane just by show of hands? Okay, good. Okay, so he, he made an album called Love Supreme, and on the inside there's these liner notes. And I don't know if you, if you have the album, go home and check it out. But on the inside liner notes, I feel like it really fleshes out what we're talking about here. He saw his work as the sacred calling. He saw the creativity and the effort and the energy put into his work as the sacred calling and as an opportunity to worship God and give thanks. And here's what he said. He says on, on part of the album, he says, this album is a humble offering to him. This is my attempt to say thank you, God, through our work. Isn't that beautiful? He sees his work and the gifting that God has given him as a way to express gratitude to God. Even as we do it in our hearts and in our tongues, and may he help and strengthen all men in every good endeavor. Whatever people do, may they be able to embrace it, may they be able to do it in a way that not only benefits others, but gives him glory and becomes a spiritual powerful force. So here's what I want to do. I want to give us a real practical challenge together this morning. Something that we can do this next week. You can do this next week. This next week, I want to challenge you to take God with you to work. Take God with you to work this week. That, that is the answer to my friend's question. How can I live a life fully surrendered to God when most of my time is not spent in church, it's actually spent in work? Do this. Take God with you to work. In fact, why would you not want to take God with you to work? Of all the places where he needs to be and wants to be, we sometimes live as Monday morning atheists, right? We worship God, we celebrate God here, and then we kind of leave him here, and we leave him in a small group, or you leave him in your devotion type, and then I'm going off to work. And I'm going to just say this, take God to work with you. Just invite, God, I invite you to be a part of my day today. Lord, every step of it. And lead me and guide me. Help me to do it in a way that honors you. 
Lord, help me to do it in a way as I'm working for you. And rem can you remind me of that as I'm going through the day? And remind me that these interactions that I have with these people, they're not ordinary interactions. These are divine moments where I have the opportunity to make the good news of Jesus Christ attractive by the way that I treat them and the way that I do my work. Whew! You invite God into your way and you just say, God, help me to see the people that I work with as your divine assignment. Jesus, these are people that you want to know you. So, Lord, help me to do what I do as if you're my boss today. And, Lord, in the moments where I, I feel weak and I need strength, help me to get strength from your spirit. And, Lord, where in the moments where I need perspective and need to remember that I work for you, help me to remember in those moments. And we take God to work. How many of you go, I'm up for that? Go ahead. So I'll give you a, another chance. How many of you are up for that? Come on. Let, 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 let's do that this week. Let's just do that this week. And then I, I guarantee you, God will do amazing things in your life and through your life if you enter into your Monday morning with that kind of perspective. Because finding meaning and fulfillment and purpose, it is difficult. But not so much so when we understand that our work is from God, our work is for God, and God has a way that he wants us to work for him. He wants us to give our best to it. Why? Because we serve not just a boss or a company, but we serve him. And when we do this, we make the good news of Jesus attractive. Your work can be a sacred calling when you see it and when you receive it as a mission assignment from God to serve other people and to make the gospel, the good news, attractive. No matter what you do.